Living in, on the, in the margin of society, struggling in poverty, people like a poor teen on the south side of Syracuse, maybe homeless, and uh, with a local gang trying to recruit him. A father addicted to gambling, not able to provide for his family, or a single mom whose spouse is in jail looking for a good paying job. Over and over, Jesus served these people like this, this served these people, and our church, one of our missions is to do the same. The, National, the United Methodist Church has established Human Relations Day as a special Sunday that calls for all our, our churches to participate in helping all of God's children to realize their potential. You may have wondered what that red and blue envelope is in your, in your bulletin. Now you know. It's an opportunity for all of us to participate in the National Methodist Program. This is a good program that speaks to the needs of our community as well as the mission of our church. I hope you will join me in participating in this effort that correlates to the story we all know so well, the Good Samaritan. Let's help some of those in our community who are underserved and help them to recover from the wounds of poverty and dysfunction. Thank you very much. And now we'll have the uh, choral intro. You all join me in our call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The whole earth is wrapped in darkness. All the nations are sunk in deep darkness. But the Lord arises upon you, and God's glory will appear over you. All nations will come to the light of God's glory. Please rise if you're able to join in the singing of the first Noel. Oh, 
share with you. And then that news was by, heard by those who were not of God's normal people. And so those magi from the east, from Persia, from modern day Iraq, came following a star. Those you wouldn't expect to be looking for the savior of the world came from afar, following a star. And then they came to Israel. God's people, and that's who we are. And so we find foreigners proclaiming the good news to even God's people. May we know the good news. May we be the ones that take that good news to others. Listen to this word that comes to us from Romans chapter 12. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to the, all the others. In God's grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is in serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift 
for showing kindness to others. Do it gladly. We enter into a new year, and as we enter a new year, we also enter into new leaders. And I would ask that those who are, have accepted responsibility for leading our church on its various its committees or mission teams, would you rise where you are seated? Come on, you're out there. There we go. Candace is standing up. You're a trustee, ministry of council, worship team, you name it. Choir members, bell choir members, arise. Hallelujah choir, rise. Those who knit, those who pray with others, those who care for others, who, those who are involved in senior ministries, rise, rise. Look at those who are in your midst, who have given of their time, their talents to serve. Dear friends, you have been called by God and chosen by this congregation to assume special responsibilities in the administration and leadership of this church. Your duties include many tasks needful for its welfare and for the advancement of the kingdom of God. In addition, all of you share in the duty of counseling with your, with your pastors and of assisting them in the leadership of the spiritual and temporal life of this church. Above all, it is your duty, as much as it lies in you, to be a positive example in your devotional life. Worship attendance, financial support, and general service in the relationships with one another and this congregation. Having heard the gospel that you are indeed called to ministry within the kingdom of God and that such service is a privilege as well as a responsibility, will each of you accept this opportunity and seek to accomplish the possibilities that lie before us? If you do, Please respond by saying, I will, the Lord being my helper. I will, the Lord being my helper. Praise God. Please be seated. And would you join me in prayer? Oh, holy God, we thank you this day for these who have been named and called by you to give leadership in directing the temporal life of this congregation. May they help in strengthening the spiritual life of this church. Mold the laity, clergy, and staff of this congregation into a unit of ministry that is invincible to evil and unfailing in good. Grant them grace to give themselves wholly to this and their task and service. Grant them sincerity and singleness of mind. Hold ever before them the example of their Lord, who pleased not himself, but gave himself up for us all, sharing his ministry and consecration they enter into his joy. Guide them in their work for your church. Reward their fidelity with knowledge, the knowledge that you are using them for the accomplishment of your purpose in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
as those who serve in your midst. I pray and hope that you'll recognize them and that after the service that you'll make a particular point to approach some of them and just say thank you for offering yourself for us and for Christ. But you know, it's not just the commitment of a few, but it's a commitment for the entire congregation that we are here to live for Christ and to serve Christ. I'm going to ask if Pastor Ellison would come forward and lead us in a litany of consecration for the entire church. And folks are going to follow along on the screen. Because the church exists as the physical body of Christ and is responsible for teaching the word of God as contained in the Old and New Testaments, Oh, oh help, help us by, by your, your spirit, spirit, O Lord, Lord to, to discern your word and will for our day and, and to, to assist, assist others in your way. way. Because the church exists to celebrate the actions of Christ in his ministry through the sacraments of holy baptism and holy communion, we, we will observe and celebrate every means of grace you have provided to keep close to you, O oh Lord. Because the church exists for the preaching of the gospel and calling all people to repentance and nurturing them in faith. We will be bold to acknowledge Christ before others, careful to witness with integrity and compassion. Because the church exists to be the tangible body of Christ in the world, we engage in actions that reflect his love for the world to be Christ's healing presence, to expend ourselves for justice for all people, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the exposed, educating the ignorant, counseling those imprisoned by evil, providing for and protecting the vulnerable. O oh oh Lord, Lord, help, help us, us to live, to live as, as those who will be accountable for how, how we live and serve. serve. May we, we never dissuade, dissuade others from faith, faith by what, what we say or do, or and may our deeds reflect the integrity and grace we know in you. Let us join in our choral call to prayer, number 473, Lead Me, Lord. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious are you and worthy of our praise and service. The creation is filled with your glory. Blessed are you forever and ever. In the light of your perfection, we see our own failings, Lord. We become preoccupied by our own needs. Forgive us for the times when we have neglected others and have lacked generosity and compassion. While asking for forgiveness on a personal basis, we also realize that our country needs divine inter intervention to bring us back into your good graces. Use us all, Lord, as your conduit to restore civility, responsibility, and moral values that this country was built on. And Lord, our elected leaders need our help. Decisions being made by President Obama Congress and the Supreme Court will dictate the direction of our nation that our nation travels. Activate us, the people of your church, so that we may affect those decisions in a way 
that would be satisfying to you by reflecting our Christian values. Each week we hear of another terrible tragedy caused by radical Islamic terrorists or, other, or their agents, extremists using their religion as justification for horrific acts continually test, they, that continually test us. Watch over our military who are supporting us, Lord. Be with them always. We are looking for answers. Touch the lives and affect the thinking of the world's political leaders and the religious leaders so that a just solution could be implemented that causes change and leads to world peace. Our hearts go out to the families and the loved ones of the 17 people who lost their lives in France this past week. We pray for the souls of the fallen and strengthen our resolve to resist the devil's goal of a chaotic world. Inspire all Christians to be agents of change, to right the wrong that we have imposed on the planet you have entrusted to us. We close with a simple prayer. Enable us as a church and as Christians who have been blessed with affluence and what we call a comfortable lifestyle to share with others and bear their burdens with them and to work diligently as your disciples for the benefit of all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May I have the children come forward for our moments together? Hi there, Lily. How are you doing? Good. I brought something to show you. Have you ever seen anything like this? Of course, you can't see what it is because it's in a holster, is it? Or some type of holder. Let me show you what it is. Ooh. What would you call this? Yeah. A what? A microscope? Well, you could, I suppose, use it as a microscope, but it's kind of like a telescope. Have you ever looked up into the stars in the sky? That made me think of the Magi because they followed a star in the sky, didn't they? This is actually, some people use binoculars. They're called binoculars because bi means two. This only has one. This is a binocular? Well, I don't know. It's a telescope, I guess. I got this while doing stuff with the Navy. And anyways, what this is, is you can turn and look. Oh, look at those people up there in the balcony. Wow. You know, there's a story about someone who was in a balcony one time, and the preacher, who was Paul, spoke too long, and it got late, and they fell asleep, and they fell out of out the balcony and onto the floor. But that was okay. They were, they were okay. Paul prayed over them, and they woke up, and he continued on preaching. Probably should have ended. But anyways, you know. But this is, these are really cool things because you can see far away. But how come there's only one? Why wouldn't I, if you have binoculars, you have two. Ah. Why do you think there's only one? Why? I didn't buy two. You're good. You're good. That's right. <laughs> I, I thought it would be because, you know, this was used more for sailing. And so, you know, you often see pirates, they have a patch over one eye, so that way they can, you know, look out with one eye. Of course, the patch is on this side, they can look out this side, right? No, that's not really true. Um, it's because we sometimes need a focus. You know, we need to focus on that which is true and where we need to go, and that's what God does for us. That's what the, those magi, those wise people, that came all so far distant, they were followed a star. Can you believe that? They looked up and followed a star, and they found Jesus. And so sometimes in order for us to really find Jesus and what Jesus wants for us, we have to also have a focus and, and look. And sometimes it takes time, but when we do, we can always see Jesus around. In Sunday school, in your friends, teachers, people at church, your family, we need to always be looking for Jesus and following that star, the light, because if we follow the truth about Jesus, we'll always be happier. We'll always have Jesus with us, which always comforts us. Let's have some prayer together.
And Jesus, we thank you for loving us. May we follow you. May we focus in on you and allow you to lead us all of our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, children. have that famous song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Would you join us in singing that together? We three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts, three travers so far Field and fountain, moor and mountain Following yonder star Oh, star of wonder, star of light Star with royal beauty bright Westward leading, still proceeding Guide us to thy perfect Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading still. perfect light. Frankincense to offer have I, incense owns a deity now. Prayer and praising, voices raising, worship be God on high. Oh, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright. Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to the perfect light. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering bloom. Sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. Oh. Star of light, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to the light. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, sounds through the earth and skies. God, please be seated, and may our ushers come forward to receive the gifts that we give to the Christ child. receive our gifts and put them to your use. Amen. You'll see in the uh, bulletin that um, 
there's a question of uh, one who opened my eyes to see Jesus. And uh, a story popped up in my head that uh, was one of the most significant in my life, I believe. What that was is uh, my brother and sister who lived nearby about uh, seven years ago uh, told me that uh, my sister-in-law had stage four cancer. And uh, they went to the local doctors and the doctors told them to, uh, told my brother to take her home and keep her comfortable. There's nothing they could do. The, uh, they, they went to Roswell in Buffalo and they got the same answer there. And so they came home a little dejected, I would think, but in a couple of days, my, my sister-in-law, Dolores, said, I'd like to go out to the retreat in Skinny Ellis and pray. And my brother was not the type that would go to church and was a, a person of prayer, but he agreed and they went out there and for an hour they said they prayed and they wept and they prayed and when they finished, my sister-in-law told my brother, you know, I think things are going to be all right. The next day or a couple of days later, they got a phone call from my nephew in Poughkeepsie. And they said there's a doctor at Sloan Kittering, a surgeon that would see her. And so that they said, great. We, they went down there and the doctor greeted them by saying, I'm going to save your life. So after a 13-hour uh, operation with two teams of surgeons, they took every cancer cell out of her body. After five years, she celebrated that five-year period, and two years later, she's still here with us. Amen. And I asked her, I said, what do you attribute this to? And her answer, Jesus Christ. That opened my eyes. Thank you for letting me share that moment with you. offer up these gifts to you, not gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but signs of our time, our talent, our commitment to serving you. Please bless these gifts and the commitment that they represent. Bless those who will receive them, and bless all who seek your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to welcome any visitors who are here. There are some purple bags over here to the side and in the back. If you'll see an usher, we'll give that to you so that you have some information. I'm not sure why I'm making so much noise. Um, but this is the time in our service when uh, you are invited to turn and greet those around you. I challenge you to find someone whom you don't know and to greet them with the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. And we're with your spirit.
you would like to join uh, me with the scripture, uh, I don't know that it's correct in the bulletin, but it's, uh, we're uh, doing John 1, uh, 35 through 50, if you'd like to follow along. The next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus walking along, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he had said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, what are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? He replied, come to and see. So they went and they saw where he was staying, and they remained with him there that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard that John said, what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. He led, them, he led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. The next day Jesus wanted to go to, into Galilee and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Seda, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the, prophet, and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Nathanael responded, can anything from Nazareth be good? Jesus said, come and see. Excuse me, Philip said, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, here is a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these in your lifetime. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. During uh, this past week, Kathy came over to my office and asked me, where are the questions? <laughs> I've got us trained to having life and faith questions, and I intentionally didn't share them because I want to share with them with you now. In fact, if you have a pencil, or there's one in your pew, I challenge you to go ahead and take that out. And someplace on your bulletin, go ahead and write out these questions. The first one is, who pointed you towards Jesus? Who pointed you toward Jesus? The second, what have you seen? What have you seen? The third one, what do you want to find? What is it you want to find? And the last one, how far will you go to find it? These questions are raised out of this passage of Scripture. The first one is so very important. Who pointed you towards Jesus? And I could say in my own life, I know that my family pointed me towards Jesus. I was born into an active family of the Christian faith, and I count that as a blessing. Maybe you also had that experience. Not others, now others may not, but I benefit from that. My family pointed me towards Jesus, but it's not enough to have a family legacy of faith. As Jesus said, come see for yourself. There were other people in my life who pointed me to Jesus. I can think of a time of transition in my life as a young child in which we moved to a different school district and they were on a different plan of education and I was struggling and, and all of a sudden there was a woman who took lunchtime, Mrs. Peterson, 
to sit down with a young man alone in a classroom, giving up her lunch. And I remember asking her, why would you do that to help me? She said, because I follow Jesus. I had other people in my life, from an employer, Mr. Manier, who hired a young man before the age that you should hire a young man to work. But he hired me. And he'd come out onto the dock and he'd share a soda with me and he'd share my life, ask me questions, and then share his. And in the process, shared also his faith that guided his life. Oh, there are so many other people that I could name in my life, men and women who influenced my life and pointed me to Christ, even in recent years. But I remember in one of my first years and early years of ministry as a youth pastor at that time, I worked at a church that was purposely built in Elmira, New York, after the ravaging of Flood Agnes that wiped out that city. And their intention was they were not going to, these eight families decided they were not going to abandon the city, but built a church there for intention of being, giving hope and light in a burdened and dark time. I was fortunate to take an internship and work for that church. And I remember coming in one day, and as I came through the hallway, I felt this breeze coming from a, from a doorway from one of the education rooms, and I went inside, and there I saw a window that had been shattered by a brick. And I went down on my knees and got a basket and, and started picking up the shards of glass. And I was in prayer, because you're supposed to pray for things like that, right? So I was in prayer, oh God, bring your wrath down on whoever did this. <laughs> There's a very holy moment in my life. <laughs> and just then, all of a sudden, there is this man, one of those eight heads of the household of those families that all of a sudden Ed Fallon came through the hallway. He saw me in the classroom on my knees. He said, Brian, what happened? And I shared with him. And he said, oh, as he knelt down to help me pick up the shards of glass, he said, Brian, let's pray. And I said, oh, righty. Because I know he was a man of prayer. Now I've got fortification. Boy, God's wrath is going to come down. Right? And he taught me, Ed did, a different heart of prayer as he knelt and he thanked God. God, he said, I thank you for this broken window. And my heart said, What? <laughs> I thank you for this broken window. I thank you that our presence here in this community is, goes not unnoticed. I thank you that we are disturbing others so that they might hopefully be drawn by you to faith in your son. And then he promised, Lord, with every broken window, I'll personally replace it. Needless to say, as I came to know Ed and some of the other folks, the leaders of that church, my, I felt very small and insignificant in my faith. But what they did by that experience is pointed me to Jesus. Because even after we have faith, we always need to be pointed towards Jesus. We need that. Because we forget. We sometimes just neglect all that has happened to us and that God has done to us through his grace. There are others who have a predisposition towards searching for the truth and for light. Not everyone, but others who do. And so we find that Andrew, he left his, his brother and the family business and to travel a long distance in order to follow this strange preacher in the wilderness, John the Baptist. He followed him out of the hope of finding light and truth. But then all of a sudden, one day, the one who they were following and hoping to revealed the truth to them, said, Look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, most people in our culture and people on the street won't even know what that means. It's our responsibility to describe that to them. They understood that the Lamb of God was a reference back to ancient time 
the time of Moses when all of a sudden an innocent lamb was to be slain and its blood to be put on the doorposts. And when they did so in faithfulness and following God, when the angel of death came through Egypt, it spared the children of God's people. So then when they heard the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, they knew it was pointing to that prophecy of one they had hoped would come to save the world. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus. Now, not every disciple of John's followed Jesus, but two did, we read. Andrew and some unnamed disciple, whom I believe is John himself, followed because someone pointed to Jesus. Who pointed you to Jesus? Whom will you point to Jesus? Now, we're afraid to do that sometimes because we know our own imperfection and we're afraid of the response people will give to us. If you listen to what John the Baptist said, he says, after he said, look, the Lamb of God, he also said in verse 31, I did not recognize him as the Messiah. In verse 33, he says, I didn't know he was the one. But then all of a sudden, he saw, not others, but he saw, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descend and fall and rest upon Jesus. And then he said, I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Others may not see what we see, but if we see Jesus for who he is, who we profess him to be, that is what we proclaim to others. What is it that you have seen? That's the second question. What is it you have seen in your life? How have you seen the grace of God work in your life? That's an important question to ask. Because Andrew and this other disciple responded, they then pursued Jesus. And Jesus turned and gave us our third question. What do you want? What are you looking for? What do you want? What are you looking for? I know in my life, I want my life to be more than just living how many years that God gives me to live. I want to be more than just making a living, paying my bills, having some vacations, investing in something for my future, which ultimately ends by returning back to God. I want to have significance I want something more. What is it you want? And I know that only Christ can give it to me. What is it you want? I look out in the world and I see its darkness. I hear its wounds. I hear its cries of vulnerable and victims. And because of the grace that I've known of Christ in my life, I want others to know of hope that I know is only available through Christ. All human effort will fail and be incomplete. But God has a plan beyond what we as humans and our great ingenuity and our capacity could ever provide. We cannot save this world, but only one can save this world, and only one will save this world. What is it you want? What is it you want for those in your life that you know of, those closest to you? whether it be relatives or friends or whoever it is, what is it you want for them? I pray and hope that it is also the same love that you've come to know in your life. And that's what happened. They spent the night with Jesus. And Andrew, that's all it took to confirm. You see, we each have to decide for ourselves. Someone can point the way, and we can point the way for someone else, but they have got to follow. They have got to see for themselves and so he saw for himself, and as soon, as soon as he woke up that next morning, he went to see his brother Simon. Now we just read that, we don't realize the significance of that. Because what happened is we read in other Gospels that John the Baptist was ministering along the Dead Sea in the valley just opening up near Jericho. And Galilee and the home of his brother was over 80 miles away. 
80 miles. He decided immediately, I've got to go find my brother. And so he trekked 80 miles by foot in order to find his brother. His brother, who knows what he might have been thinking. We know by what Jesus said of him that he was a rock. I imagine he said, no, I have dreams and hopes, but I'm going to stay here. I've got to take care of the family business. But he let his younger brother go off to follow a dream. But his brother never forgot. And so he went back to see his brother. And he says, brother, brother, you ought to see what I've seen. I have seen the promise made through the prophets and, the, and Moses come true. This Jesus is the Messiah. And then he tells him, come and see. Because even though Peter loved Andrew, it wasn't enough. He had to come and see for himself and so he came. As Jesus was making his way up along the Jordan, going to Galilee, they met. And as soon as he saw him, he says, Oh, Simon, I know of you. Your brother talked of you. I tell you now, you're not just Simon, but you are a rock. All of a sudden, when Jesus comes into our lives, he changes us. We're the same, but he changes us. Just as much as Peter was a fisherman, we remember how Jesus called him, oh, come, you're a great fisherman, but I'll add to your life, and you can become a fisher of people. More valuable than a fish. And so Peter followed. What well, a wonderful story. It wasn't because Andrew was so convincing, but because he pointed to Jesus, who in your life can you point to Jesus? Then there was another one as Jesus was going along, Philip, and he said, come and see. Come and see for yourself. And he saw. And immediately what he did is that he went off and saw not a brother but his best friend from his childhood. One who was a skeptic and critical. One who would be not easy to convince. But he loved him. So he went, Philip went, to see Nathaniel. He says, you've got to come and see this. I met a man who originated from Nazareth, and he is everything that we've been hoping for and is his pessimism. Do you know those pessimistic people? Do you? He says, oh, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. And Nathaniel came. Before he got to Jesus to say a word, Jesus, who is God in the flesh, the God who knows us more intimately than we know ourselves, that knew us while we were being formed in the womb, who knows the beginning and the end of our life and those things in between, knows what we'll do. It is he who then said, Ah, oh, Nathaniel, there is a true Israelite, a true follower of God, one who has integrity. How do you know me? You see, that's just it. When we come close to Jesus, we find one who knows us so fully. And when Jesus disclosed himself to him, he fell to his knees and says, My God, my Lord. You see, the closer we come to Jesus, the more we are aware of who he is. But we each must come and see who has pointed you towards Jesus. What have you seen? What, what do you want to find? And if we find Jesus, all of a sudden there is born within us a heart that says, I need others to see him too. And the question is for us, how far will you go? The church is asleep. We are. And we have a story to tell. We have grace that we have known and others need it. How dare we keep it to ourselves? During this series on evangelism, Alice and I will be challenging you to do many things. 
And just as there are four questions I share with you, here are some other four things I would have you write down that I'm asking you to do. The first thing to do is I'm asking you to pray. Pray. I don't mean those selfish prayers of, oh God, get them back. I don't mean those prayers that have to do about, oh, give me everything that I want. But really those prayers about everything that you want to find. Give me Jesus. Help me. Show me. Show me the persons closest to me that you will lead me to, that you will help me to point the way for you. And the second thing besides prayer, I ask you to identify. Say, God, you show me. But be careful, because when you pray and you say, God, you show me who you want me to point to you, be careful what you pray for, because God will show you. And then you'll be responsible. And the third thing that I would ask you to do is to relate to that person, get close to them, spend some time with them, get to know them better so that you can have an opportunity to do the fourth thing, is invite them. See, all we have to do is point to Jesus. We don't have to seal the deal, because only Jesus can do that. Come and see, come and see what made a difference in my life. Come and see, come and see the one who I think will make a difference in your life. Come and see, come and see, and as they come and see with you, within the family of faith, Maybe through the word, maybe through the Holy Spirit, maybe through the love and the acceptance of this body of Christ, they will not only come and see, but they will find. All we have to do is point the way to invite. This is a true thing that I'll share with you. The more committed and invested, the more clearly you will see. Repeat that. The more committed and invested, the more clearly you will see. The more clear you will see Jesus. There are times in my journey of faith I have forgotten just the immensity of what Christ has done for me. But then all of a sudden, I've been reawakened to what Christ does. When all of a sudden I see what Christ does in someone else's life. And it reminds me what Christ has done in my life. I'm selfish. I want people to come to know Jesus, not just for them. I want them to come to know Jesus just for me. Because every time I see Jesus do something positive in someone's life, it reminds me of what Jesus has done in my life and what Jesus can yet do. What is it you want to see people? I see vacant seats in the sanctuary. I see even more vacant seats at 8 o'clock service and 11 o'clock service. And that makes me cry. Not because I want the fame of being able to go and, or else and be able to go before other preachers say, oh, our church is doing great. Because every single person matters and I want people to know Jesus because they need Jesus. And I need them to find Jesus. How about you? In a few weeks, we're going to be asking you to identify whoever God might place upon your heart. And we're going to ask you to make a commitment to reaching out to them. You see, caring does not come by accident. It comes by intention. How far will you go? Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, people need the Lord. Even as we need you, people need the Lord. Help us to point the way. Just as others have pointed the way for us. Give us a passion. Give us compassion. Let us not be stingy with all the beauty and wonder you have brought to our lives, but be willing to give it away. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Sisters and brothers, would you rise with me and sing number 430, O Master, let me walk with thee. Jesus be your telescope, a single focus. May you go as the Magi did, knowing that you seek the light of the world. May you know that wise ones still seek him, and that those who seek, seek him still find. Go now in peace, in the name of the one Jesus called Abba, Father, in the name of the one who called Jesus and who calls you my beloved child, in the name of the Holy Spirit that calls to each of us. Amen. <laughs>